that you see there was now wasn't there then of course it was the cross in Croydon's field and all such was the RIC house was there and the barracks was there and anyway it was rumoured uh, that um, uh, Mikhail Dan had given some information to the to the RIC during the Tan War so he was given 24 hours to, to move out and the station house and barracks were burnt down in 1920 and the new station was built uh, from the compensation money. That's why it's such a big station because they had over £3,000 compensation so they had to spend it all and it's quite a big station for really what was a very small station if you understand what I mean. That was built in 1924-25 and Paddy Nolan became the station master and after him came Jim Cronin from Grantham and he was moved on into Killarney and then there was a widow, a widow a, a Mrs. O'Sullivan, a widow succeeded him. She married a, a, a Flanagan man from uh, Kinmare, he was station master there and then moved away up country. And my sister Sheila took over in October 1938. Uh, I, I was about four months old then. And uh, she was there until 1960 and as you know she moved on to Ratcool uh, as gatekeeper and she died in, there in 1994. She had spent 56 years uh, with the railway. I was making up recently, there were five generations of railway people on my mother's side and three on my father's side. And I was making up uh, the, the years they gave to railway companies and it came to over 400 years in all. So it was good service if you like. I don't know who was station master in Morley's but, but it was closed down in 1936 and the house was sold. Now Dan Cattell, we all knew Dan very well, was in, in, in Kilgarra for many years and in my time in Kilmare there was a man called uh, Tim O'Leary. Now th there were other trains other than the, the two trains, one to, one to Hedford and back at 11 o'clock and then the 2 o'clock and back at 4. There were special traffic. You, there were four trains every day as I said and then you had the inspection cars and the inspector was like little buff you know what I mean, and that, that came along, and there was a spray train, and then there were ballast trains to put in extra stones if any of them were washed out and so on, and there were specials, and then there were the bogies. The bogie was a little um, wooden affair that was put on two wheels, and you legged it on, uh, and the miles had that in each in each thing. Now, I remember there was one of those, and it was unfortunately put at the end of the platform on a toe, with the wheels facing the platform, and of course there was a, an incline down. And I remember that uh, on, on, on one occasion, uh, there was a McCarthy man, I don't know, which is a McCarthy now from, from, from uh, the other, uh, had ordered uh, some stuff for Mackie Shays, and among the stuff ordered were six chimney pots. Now, as you know, they're all, they're all lovely. So when I was about six, I suppose, and my sister Nari, on the evening, we had a little uh, competition to see who could roll the fastest down. Needless to say, they hit the bogey and they broke into smithereens and my poor sister Sheila had the invite she had to go into Mackie Shays the following morning and make good uh, the goods before the, they came to collect them. Uh, so maybe uh, Johnny Patsell right my, my had a little bit of a name as they say for being cross. Anyway, um, the, 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 there were the specials, the bogies and so on. And you had the specials that ran from March to November. These what you would call the fair specials, uh, the Kinmare cattle fairs. And you had a whole crowd of people working on them. You had loading porters and you had inspectors there as well. And then you had regular inspectors and as I said, you had the inspector cars. Now, three men that I remember their names were Harman, Foot and Sides. They were inspectors that I recall. Now, you had drivers there for the specials. They were separate to the other. They usually came out of the cock line. And there was a man called Deneen and Coffey uh, from Fermi Branch. Jim Lynch, uh, who was the father of Joe. He came in 1940 and was there for a few years. And indeed, he was, I remember him there. And uh, he, he uh, it, as I said earlier, Joe used to spend his summer holidays here as a result of his connections here. Now, there were usually 26 or 7 wagons uh, in these specials. And uh, sometimes the cattle were loaded in Kilgarvan and sometimes it's in Lowbridge. There was a little siding in Lowbridge as well. And then they were taken off these cattle from the fattening fields of Meath and Limerick. Now, Mick Conrad or Sullivan, of course, was a, was a great man. And his brother Dennis, who moved on to uh, Abba Farm. And I think another brother, his dad, in Neil Callan, 
and their grandchildren are still, great grandchildren are still going to school in Callan indeed. And I often remind them uh, of their roots and Russell Lou. They had also a sister, Margaret, who married a shopkeeper called Summers in, in uh, Callan also. So no matter where I go, I seem to, to uh, find people from home. Now the specials stopped at Lowbridge Bridge and they either went for tea to our house or they went over to Manus's for a, a pint. It was a leisurely way of life, you see. Now, then you had such things as floods. I believe there was a big one here uh, in Clare that recently, is that right? Yeah. And, and seemingly the 29th of June is, is a favourite date for floods in, uh, in Clare. Maybe it's not a laughing matter because certainly in the 1838 when there were, there were lives lost and, and, and so on. Well, you were flooding, of course, in, in the Lou too, and um, th th there were, when the line was being laid originally, uh, six miles and a half miles from uh, Hedford, that would be around Connells, maybe a bit beyond there, they couldn't get foundation for the building a bridge there, they couldn't get foundation. So, they got the men to cut a new channel uh, for the Lou, and that's where the Lou is now. So they moved the Lou over. And this was all done, as I say, by, by, by pick and shovel and so on. And then they struck new foundations, so it's, I think in a place called uh, Gortelay. And later on, the place was uh, subject to, to severe flooding. And there was a famous one in August 1938, uh, after continuous rain, there was a mighty flood, and the ballast was all washed away, and all the gangs on the line, plus Ratmore and Killarney, they came, worked through Saturday and Sunday, and they had the track ready again for Monday. There were floods also in 41 and 42. Now, I, I just towards the close of, of, of this evening's uh, proceedings, uh, but uh, Jimmy Darcy, who was just introduced to there a moment ago, would, would like to um, recite, but I'll let you introduce yourself to me and, uh, and say it before. I'll do it once in my phone. I'm not sure, another man I need not introduce, he's the one with the beginning of the week. Last week I was going through a couple of boxes of old stuff and um, those letters that my mother used to collect and send to me and a lot of other bits and pieces. And I came across uh, a poem or a song that I'd written uh, God only knows how many years ago. So I, I got your to type it up again and change bits and pieces of it. So I just said, you know, I, I put the name on the great you wear on. I tell you the tale and it won't take me long of a beautiful railway I remember in song. It started in Hedford, I'm sure you've been there, and it stopped in the picturesque town of Kilmare. It opened for traffic in 1893, a branch off the main line that runs to Trilene. A bare 20 miles for a reasonable fare, the party twice daily for the town of Kilmare. You pass by the Drumcarbon and the quarry at Cradle, where the ballast was taken for under the rail. Then on up the glade with its beauty so rare, the steam engine whistling its way to Kilmare. The line crossed the road of my own island moor, continued through inch for a good mile or more. Then on to the to valley with its water so fair, the very first stop on the way to Kilmare. Then back to the valley or Colomon Ridge, the guard says the next stop will be Morris Bridge. Kilgarvan will follow and you better beware, before you didn't realize that you'd be in Kilmare. There was regular service and special as well. There was tourists and local and others I tell. Be it match day or shopping or going to the fair, you could bank on a crowd for the train to Kilmare. The valleys of stress and of rookie so fine gave pleasure to anyone using the line. With high towering mountains and rivers so rare to help you along on the trip to Kilmare. The years they pass by and changes contrived. Alternative methods of transport arrived. With running costs rising and losses to bear, the end was in sight for the line to Kilmare. Objections were lodged, but the hierarchy said, the cost-cutting plans were progressing ahead. The line was closed up in late 59, and that was the end of the Great Kilmare Line.
Lord. It's marvelous to see such a great crop of people here present today at this Mass in the Church of Our Lady of Wayside in County. And I heartily welcome each and every one of you to this great celebration. And it is one of the high points of our weekend celebration here in County that we should come together on this day, the Feast of the Transfiguration, to worship together in the midst of this glorious area. I would like to welcome all of those of you who have come a distance to be here for the Mass and for the weekend. I would like particularly to welcome my colleague and old friend, Father Dennis Burke, who served in this parish, he tells me, in the early 60s. And I don't know whether at the end of the time here he got demoted or promoted because he got sent to the street. <laughs> Thank you. 
He's in the middle of the floor. Did you do that? Yeah. Are you finished? That's the new thing. We're going to uh, use gravity now to get up. Well, that's the way we're equipped. Look at that. Yeah. Hey, we'll take out this one. And I'm going to take up the Mr. Wood as well. And hopefully, he get a big cheer for having survived the ordeal of water. Yeah. Are you all right? The boys and girls don't believe me because some magicians tell lies. Would you check it out to make sure there's nothing in it? Corners and all, no, nothing there at the moment. Could you make a noise like a chicken? Could you have... <laughs> See if there's any in it now. I don't know. Oh. Ooh. Oh, a real plastic. Oh. Hey, we don't want to break. Did you know that some hens are very fast? If you squeeze an egg from the ends like that, no matter how hard you squeeze, even a JCB digger, my glitches will not break the egg. So what happens if you squeeze like that? Ah! Oh, come on, come on. There it is. Put it back in the bag. To enable everybody to see it's in the bag, we have the netting. Can you see it now, then? Yeah! Now, what I'm going to do, because I'm the magician here today, I'm going to make that disappear. Some of you okay, over here. You may, see, you may see where it goes, but say nothing, because we're going to fool the ones on that side. You simply take the egg like this, say the magic word, giddy giddy, hope it's focus, and when you're finished, there's absolutely nothing at all in Timothy in the back. It's not under my arm. No, no, it's not under the other one either. It's not under that one, and it's not under that one. It's definitely not under that one. Put it in my pocket, Timothy. Is it in there in my pocket? Show it well in there now. I even the magic wand this time now. I want you to be careful with this now. And no fooling because he's going to take the magic wand and he's going to tap the egg once with the magic wand and... I'll give you the wooden one. Hang on a second now. I got one of the others. That's the... That's the better one. I'll give you the good plastic one now. That's the... That's the good plastic one now. Don't let it bend, whatever you do. <laughs> Wave it over the back. <laughs> the bag has got the measles. <laughs> Did you ever have the measles? Bad doors, you know. That's what happened to Harvey Dean. We must get another fella. I got an idea. This man. Your name is? Gavin. Gavin, is it? I'm very pleased to meet you, Gavin. Can I call you Gav for short? You can call me Mr. Silvano. Gavin is going to do his sack attack. Would you like to see that? Yeah! No, it's very... Gavin, the only thing, it's 180 if you break it. Is that all right? It's 180. No, Gavin, don't drop it. That's it. I've got one as well for Marie to look. I'm going to spin these very fast. No dropping stake. Okay. Gavin is going to do the trick that's promised like so. This is the Irish one, look. He's going to go... Like that. Of course you can. Hey! Come on, Sandy, you can do it. He didn't go too far. She's done it! We're going to get another... We're going to get another fella. Oh, wait, wait, see, hi. Who is that? Yeah. You haven't been in this. I'm going to put this man. Your name is? Daniel, I put you over there, and I'll put, uh, I'll put Rita there, and I'll put uh, Gavin here. You know what I'm going to do now? I'm going to turn you back to the audience. I'm going to turn you back, and I'm going to dress you up. There's one here for, uh, there's one here for, uh, Daniel. Hold on to it, Daniel. Put your face there like that. Not your head, just your face. And there's one... Oh, sorry, there's a mistake here. Would the two of you turn back, please? The two of you, would you change places? I mixed up the boys and the girls. Change over there. And we're going to take that. You can't mix up the boys and the girls. You'll be killed. Now, this is better. I can't mix them up. This is your one, Marita. This is the competition, and it's going to be judged by Paul Wright. Who should do it? It's going to be judged by... 
<laughs> by Paul, come on, Bruce. <laughs> by Paul Wright. And I've got, I'm looking in that I have the biggest Paul Wright picture that you can get. You can touch the back if you like, but you can't touch this Paul Wright surface because I'm going to put it in the latest flat disc camera. Now, because the camera is smiling at you, lads, you also smile at the camera and it says funny photos. So, you know, I like you, lads, but I don't like you that much. Over there, behind your speaker. That's the place to see it, so. They'll be all on top of me. That's right. I'm going to take a little. Oh, that's way steady, Gavin. The legs of the dancer there. My God, Timothy, the most unsexy swimsuit is starting to be. I saw a man swimming in one of them one time when I was young in England. We've gone a bit briefer than that, no one will. Oh. Didn't she come out well? Marita, because you were extremely good for winning and posing in the first place, I'm going to make for you, from a balloon, any animal in the world you like. What will you go for? Would you like a doggy?
having met him, I was discussing it with uh, the late uh, Sean Hatsley O'Donoghue. And I said, uh, I met somebody, and I didn't ever guess who it was, and uh, I'd given another clue or two, and he said, Ah, Frenchie, who else? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> Frenchie has, has returned to me with us tonight, and we're very glad to have Francie O'Donoghue uh, with us. Uh, I often have occasion, or sometimes have occasion, to visit the city, his adopted city of Kilkenny, and I bump into him now and again on the street, and uh, we have a little chat, and you know, he never says something like, and he knows who Kilhan or how things in Kerry, or, uh, and he has the wrong clock key or anything like that. He always raises the question to us, how are things at home? Are and he knew at home. Yeah. Because always at home, with fancy. Always, how are things at home? How are the people at home? Are, how is, and he keeps extremely up to date with affairs from home, because if somebody was sick or whatever, he would inquire about it also, and in the same conversation. So he has come home tonight to, uh, to, to talk to us for a while. And we hope afterwards if you have any um, comments or additions to make or observations to make on, on, on the talk, we would be glad to hear them. And I think his mention of home and that whole idea of how they are at home and so on ties in very well with the ideas we had for this weekend. It was a chance for people living away from home to come back home and meet the neighbours and friends and so on again and have a chat and, and so on. So uh, this is all tonight is to bring to mind uh, some of the people, or as many of the people as I can remember, and indeed I'm very indebted to my brother Doni, uh, uh, who I would say is the original memory man, man and certainly in our family, because I mind his memory as well as my own and others of course to, to come up with some of the uh, uh, pieces of information and some of the little stories which I'll tell you as we go along. But to get out the historical part of it out of the way first, we talk about <coughs> the building of the railway itself, uh, which started in 1890, that's uh, 110 years ago, at least I can uh, subtract a bit in any case, uh, <coughs> and it was finished in 1893. Now the, the GS, Great Southern and Western Railway, were of course the company involved. Uh, the, the cost was uh, a mere 140,960 pounds. <laughs> the pay was big in those days. <laughs> the British Treasury paid 50,000, uh, and we were under the British Treasury in those days. Uh, the Great Southern and Western Railway paid 90,000. Nine hundred and sixty, and the local contribution in their something else was two thousand and four hundred pounds. That's the, the, the historical bit. But behind that uh, little piece of history, you had the men and the women and uh, 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 of the railway line. They built it, pick and shovel, and so on for twenty miles. It was an enormous feat of work, in my in my view, in three years. Uh, the, 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 it was, I believe, Scottish engineers who were in charge, and they did record in places that they were amazed at the strength of individual men uh, who worked uh, on the railway. Men they saw moving uh, stones that were 300 weight in, 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 in weight. Uh, however, uh, the, the, the thing was done, and I'll carry on now to talk to you about the people who worked in the railway. And I'm going to talk to you about the milesmen, because of course, not only was I the father of a milesman, I was the grandson, the son of a milesman, I was the grandson of a milesman, and I was the great grandson of a milesman, because each, each man uh, was to a mile, they, they walked the mile, and they checked the, 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 uh, the state of the uh, rails and so on, and there were what they called keys, that you kept the tension in it and so on, and they saw that, for example, if there was a flood, had been a flood and so on, that there would be no ballast uh, washed away. So each of them, walked the mile each morning. A group of people, and my, my great-grandfather, the man I mentioned earlier on, he was a gatekeeper outside Kilani, and then my mother was a gatekeeper uh, in Lowbridge, of course, and hence we were known as the Gates, France of the Gates, and Sean of the Gates, and so on, to <laughs> <laughs> distinguish him from the crew of the and Tom's and all the others in the valley. Um, uh, then you had Maggie Leach, uh, and she was uh, there, to, uh, this side of Maldi's Bridge, she would have been, of course, and then you had uh, uh, people in Crail and, and Kilgarn and so on. Maggie Lynch was uh, 
a grand aunt of, of Joel Lynch, uh, the actor, and indeed Joe, who uh, spent a lot of his summers here in, 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 in Lenskerry, around the bridge and, 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 and so on. And I remember some years ago, he was being in, in, interviewed on RTE, and the, the, the interviewer was doing his best to, to, to get him to talk about his career, but Joe insisted on talking about the great time he used to have a child, as a child, around uh, uh, Clanky, Lowbridge, and so on. The guards then, they were the, the people, uh, uh, you know, the guards van was like a converted cattle wagon. They had a little sheltered place in the middle, and they had a little bar for, for the door, but it was very cozy. There was a stove in there, and so on. And you had uh, Jimmy, uh, sorry, Jimmy Curry, O'Donnell. He'd be the uncle now of, of uh, Jimmy Curry back there. And he lived in Kilmare. Then you had Jimmy Mahoney and Paddy Lynch, John O'Rourke, there were other guards. Uh, to tell you the kind of, of pace of life that was going on in those days, uh, Jimmy's brother Tim, Tim was a great storyteller by the way, he used to come to our house regularly telling stories, he was a great man to tell ghost stories, and uh, it was very hard going up the stairs afterward, after one of the Tim ghost stories, but it was only years afterward when I heard that actually he would be afraid of his own ghost stories. <laughs> My mother got me to a story that we that lived back in the cottage. <coughs> it's gone now, of course, and the gates are gone, but you know what I'm talking about there, just below John Crowley's. And, uh, and my father and, and, and uh, Tim were, were drinking in, in Minas's one night, and they were there sort of late. Uh, even the late John Ardenou hours uh, existed that time. Anyway, my mother heard them coming along around half one, and they were as the same mobilior. And she heard the two uh, on the dance talking away. They stopped in front of the cottage and they talked away for a while. And then uh, Tim said, we'd better go home. And it just struck him that he'd have to pass through Paris, which was behind Connell's. And they did the name of being haunted. <laughs> and Connell and Deal, as they say, Tim was afraid to go home. My father said, should that's grand. He said, I'll convey you home. So the next thing, the two lads got back again because my father was afraid to come back. <laughs> now, my mother knew the score, but she decided to let them sober up, and eventually my father came back alone. So that's the kind of pace of life that were there and the people that were in it. Um, move on, the drivers, and here are some of them again, just to give you a flavor. Dan O'Shea was one, and then there was a man called Dan the Poet Murphy. Uh, and this was, he was called the poet Murphy after his father, who was a driver in Cork. Uh, and a signal man complained about this uh, Murphy man one time to the company because he did not leave the oil for the lamp near enough to the cabin. Uh, and he was asked to explain in a letter from the company. And he, he replied in writing in Bersters, It is indeed true, as this man did say, I left the oil on the permanent way. Well, had I known that his feet were sore, I would have left the aisle at the cabin door. And the signal man was called for a medical. It was found that he had bed, it was bad on his feet, and he was demoted to porter, so it's better not to complain too loudly. So we call Dan, I'm still with station masters, I digress there for a little while. And he was the first station master in Lubridge. And the station house <laughs> Thank you. 
for John, Julie and family. I hope we're So if you can go up here, and I'll try and find one of Julie and John, I don't know. turning grey, drifting in like painted butterflies from paddocks far away. Drooping dainty wings and fancy, and the pictures fading fast, stand again in rose and purple in the album of the past. There's that old cat slap cabin dreaming by the wistful watchful trees, where the cooler bars are listening to the stories of the bees. There's a wholesome welcome beaming from those big, bright, cheery eyes, and the sugar loaf behind it, blackened in against the skies. And there's that same dear, happy circle round the boreys' cheery blaze, and the little Irish mother telling tales of other days. She had one sweet, holy custom which I never can forget, I'm and a gentle benediction crowns her memory for it yet. I'm I can see that little mother still and hear her as she pleads. Now tis getting on for bedtime. All you children, <laughs> get your beads. Good girl. There were no steel-bound conventions in that old slab dwelling free. Only this, each night, she lined us up to say the rosary. And in the stranger there who stayed the night upon his journey knew that he must join that little circle, I and take his deck it too. And I think she darkly plotted when a sinner hoved in sight who was known to say no prayer at all to make him say the back. And then we gently gather round her, and in accents sweet and low, she would pray like Saint Dominic so many years ago. 
and that little Irish mother's face was radiant, for she knew that where two or three were gathered, he was gathered with them too. What? Or the patters and the abbeys, how her reverend head would bend, and she'd kiss the cross devoutly when she counted to the end. <laughs> And the visitor would rise at once and brush his knees, and then he'd look very, very foolish as he took the boards again. For she had other prayers to keep him. They were long, long prayers in truth. <laughs> and we used to call them trimmings <laughs> in my disrespectful view. She would pray for Keith and King and everyone she'd ever known. Yes, and every one of us could boast a trimming all his own. She would pray for all our little needs, and every shade of care that should venture over the sugar loaf, she greeted with a prayer. She would pray for this one's sore complaint, that one's hurted hand, or that someone else might make a deal and get that bit of land. Amen. Or that dad might sell the cattle well, and season's good might rule, so that little John, the weekly one, might go away to school. Amen. Trimmings too that came and went, but near she closed without saying that very special trimming. Again. None of you must speak about. Gentle was that little mother, and her wit <coughs> would sparkle free. But she'd murder him who looked around while saying the rosary. And if perchance you lost your beads, disaster waited you. For the only one she'd pardon was himself, because she knew he was hopeless. <coughs> it was sinful the excuses he'd invent. So she let him have his fingers, and he cracked them as he went, and be that he wasn't certain if he counted five or ten, but he'd face the prices <laughs> bravely, and he'd scat around again. But she tallied every ticket, and she'd block him on the spot, saying, Glory, Daddy, glory! And he gloried like a shot. <laughs> She would portion out the debtors to the company at large, but when she reached the trimmings, she would put herself in charge. And it oft was cause for wonder that she never once forgot, but she kept them all in order till she went right through the lot. For that little Irish mother's prayers embraced the country wide. If a neighbor met with trouble or was taken ill or died, we could count upon a trimming. Till, in fact, it got that way that the rosary was but the trimmings to the trimmings, we would say. <laughs> and then himself was that now, Charlie, for the public good, we thought. Sure, I'll keep us here till March. You'll have got them trimmings shot. <laughs> but she'd take him very gentle till he softened by degrees. Come on, little children, put your hands upon I'm your coming. knees. So that little Irish mother kept her trimmings to the last ever growing as the shadows o'er the old procession passed. And she lit our drab existence with her simple faith and love. And I know the angels lingered near to bear her prayers above. For her children trod the path she trod, nor later did they spun to impress her wholesome maxims on their children in their time. Yeah. And every sore complaint came right, and every hearted hand. And we made a deal from time to time, and got that bit of land. And Dad did sell the cattle well, and little John, her pride. Twas he that said the mass in black. He did. The morn that she died. That's right. So her gentle spirit triumphed, for tis this without doubt was that very special trimming that she kept so dark about. But now the years have crowded past us, and the fledglings all have flown, and the nest beneath the sugar loaf no longer is their own. For a hand has written, finish, and the book is closed for good. There's a stately red-tiled mansion okay. where that old slab dwelling oh, stood. Yeah. There the stranger has her evenings and the formal supper spread. But I wonder, has she trimmings now? Or is the rosary said? Ah, those little Irish mothers passing from us one by one. Who will write the noble story of the good that they have done? For their children may be scattered 
and their fortunes wind would hurl. But the trimmings of the rosary will bless them throughout the world. And the colour. Thank you.
you say good night and then I heard my child in prayer and for me some scarlet ribbon scarlet ribbon All the streets were dark and bare In our town, no scarlet ribbons Not one ribbon for her hair The dawn was breaking. I peeped in and on her bed in gay profusion, lying there, lovely ribbons, scarlet. Scarlet ribbons for her hair. If I live to be a hundred, I will never know from where. Scarlet ribbons, scarlet ribbons for her. Hello, Sophia.